Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Day of Christmas, my true love sent to me a partridge in a pear tree. On the second day of Christmas, my true love sent to me two turtle doves. I was laying in bed this morning in the dark before getting out for the day, and I thought, oh God, I have to talk about God today. How am I going to do this? Oh God, I got to talk about you today. How am I going to do this? You think I just get up here and do this, right? You think it just comes out of the air? Well, no, it doesn't just come out of the air. It comes out of some long thoughts about it like my entire life, but for today in particular, I was saying, how can a Western, how can Western civilization go on when our enemies are using religion as a Trojan horse method to take us over? And then I said, there's a bigger question. Yes, we have a, a, a belief in freedom of religion, but that's when the word religion has a similar meaning. When you say religion, you generally think of people who believe in God and they believe in doing good and they believe in, believe in leaving people alone. So you say, of course you believe in anyone's way to reach uh, their, their beliefs in any way they want. Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, doesn't matter. Freedom of religion sounds good. But what if there's a religion that comes along that believes in order for their religion to thrive, they have to kill you or convert you? So you have to say what well, you have to, you have to curtail that. Then you have to understand that there's no such thing as an absolute when it comes to freedom of. There has to be a limitation on what you mean by religion. If the religion preaches goodness, we, we all agree it's good. But if the, religion, if the religion preaches death to others, then you have to say that's not a religion, that's a political doctrine. And that is the problem of the century. And we have a president and a media, and a government that refuses to even understand the question, let alone know the answer. So it's up to us to educate them, is it not? Did you hear what I just said? Perhaps one of the most important things I've ever said in all the years I've ever been in radio, and I said it in a way that I think is quite neutral and quite right down the center line. Sure, we believe in freedom of religion, so far as the religion teaches peace and love and the brotherhood of man. But when someone uses the concept of religion to dominate the other religions or to take over a nation, then you have to say, my friend, that's not a religion. And I don't care how many cockamamie lawyers with twisted brains from NYU come out at us, you're not going to get away with it. We'll throw them in jail or we'll throw you in jail. We'll throw every cockeyed lunatic from the ACLU in prison before we let you take over our country. So just get it straight. Don't think you can run that number by me, Johnson. See, now that's the kind of leadership we're all waiting for. Someone who can actually discern reality, someone who actually knows reality, and someone who's willing to stand up for reality. Can you name one politician who's willing to say what I just said? No. No, you can't, which is why you have such wonderful faith in politicians. Because you can't get us an iota of truth out of most of them. They're scared to death that if they say one wrong thing, they'll be out of office. I don't even blame them. With the jackals in the media, they're afraid to say a word. But I will tell you this. We're way past worrying about the degenerates in the media. I think that every man must speak his mind, whether he be a politician, a talk show host, or whatever. In order for America to be saved, I think there's only one thing that can save us, and that's the truth itself. And I think in order to get to that truth, all of us must speak out. You know, Martin Luther King Jr., Despite all of the uh, flaws, like all of us, he was a flawed man in many ways, and we know what those flaws are. He said something that I'll never forget. I read it years later. I actually heard the man speak outside the U.N. in 1960-something. I remember it. It was quite stirring. He was quite an orator, and he moved me. I didn't know anything about civil rights or the civil rights movement. Truly, at the time, I didn't pay much attention. I was a kid. But he said something I'll never forget. He said, make no mistake about it, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Those are the words of Martin Luther King Jr. Now go tell that to all of the Jew haters that you meet. Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell that all to the, to the Jew haters out there. I think that I'm the elder statesman of conservative talk radio. I actually didn't believe it, but I've, I've reached that point. I'm giving myself a title. I, I know that I'm a national, uh, um, uh, phenomenon in many ways, but I am the elder statesman. Most of the guys are 20 years younger than me, which is fine. 
And some of them are good, but most of them don't even understand what this country has come from. They kind of read about it. But as much as I hate to admit it in a way, I've lived through it. From Eisenhower to Obama in two generations. From Ben Casey to Nurse Jackie in two generations. From mutual assured destruction to assured national destruction, two generations. From Evan Rue to Always Rude in two generations. From John Wayne to Lady Gaga in two generations. From I Spy to I Cry in two generations. From I Love Lucy to I Love Loosely in two generations. From Al Einstein to Al Gore in two generations. From I Have a Dream to I Have a Scheme in two generations. From Catcher in the Rye to Catch Up on the Fly in two generations. Starlets to Harlots, Preachers to Breachers, Athletes to Sexletes, Rabbis to Sandflies, Boy Scouts to Toy Scouts, Girl Scouts to Twirl Scouts, From the Eagle to the Beagle in two generations. From LSD to ADD, From Cardigans to Partykins, From Cub Scouts to Scouting Cubs, from aspirin to oxycontin, from Lady Jane to let's get insane, from science to lie from law to claw, from zip guns to machine guns, from Manhattans to cosmos, from red book to spread books, from acorn the tree to acorn the spree, from babies to puppies, from guppies to yuppies, from private vets to private jets, from soldiers who kill to soldiers without will. From Lassie to Sassy, from religion to pigeons, from eons to peons, from rapists to offenders, from stickball to speedballs, from gallo to Lafitte, from Matus to Chartreuse, from Milltown to Prozac, from the Air Force to a Bear Force, from the Navy to Loose Gravy, from the Army to I'm Swarmy, from Israel to Fisrael, from Taiwan to Spizwan, from the Dragon and the Eagle to the Dragon and the Beagle. From dragsters to drag queens, from redwoods to deadwoods, from health foods to wealth foods, from heroes to zeros, from UFOs to IOUs, from hirsute to lawsuit, from melarolls to melanine, from Niagara to Viagra, from Coney Island to Survival Island, from the five families to the Sly families, from Al Capone to Sly Stallone, from Ike to Spikes, Truman to Untruman, from Reagan to Swayman, Rayburn to Pelosi, from the Eagle to the Beagle, from the Bible to the Legal. That's the story of America the Great to America that greats. I'll be right back. Savage. I tell you about the dish I cooked, star flounder, and how I cooked it. I, I, there's a fish store nearby, a, a meat and fish store. I love the store. I, w I give the name for free. They let the guy, but I can't because then you'll know where I shop and you look for me there, and you'll poison the fish. So I can't give you the name of it. Well, the guy has really good stuff. He specializes in good meats and he ships them around the country, and he gets great fish. So he knows I like petrali sole. You know fillet of sole, but it's called petrali sole out here in California, Northern California. So he didn't have any yesterday. So he said, I got something better. I have star flounder. I said, what's star flounder? He said, try it. You'll like it. So I said, and I, I trust him. So I, I bought it. I cooked this fish. Well, first of all, it starts with smelling the fish. I told you I had an aunt, God rest her soul, who would go into a butcher store in the summer wearing a, a fur coat into the freezer to me because she knew the butcher was a crook. And that he would switch meats on her in the freezer. Remember that story about my aunt, God rest her soul? It was a hot August day up in the Catskill Mountains, Moish's Butcher Shop. I hope, he, I hope his, his, his descendants are not listening. And she'd pick out a steak in the cabinet in the front, the, the case, the best, most expensive steak. And she'd say, grind it up for me, make it chopped meat. Don't worry, he'd say to her, I'll be, I'll be back. And he'd go in the freezer. She always knew he went in the freezer. Put, so sure enough, she'd bring an overcoat. And go in the freezer with him because she knew he'd switch meats and give him pre-ground chuck. He, she was right. She wasn't paranoid. I was a butcher boy that summer. I delivered meats. He would go in the bin. Whatever they picked, he put on the top shelf. And he'd come out with the pre he turn the grinder on. Mm, <laughs> and nothing would go in the grinder. And then he would take the meat. He had pre-ground the chuck meat. He'd bring it out and show it to them with a smile. Take a look at this meat. It's <laughs> So she knew better than to... But anyway, the point is, she would if she went into a restaurant, which she never did in her entire life. She didn't trust restaurants. She was from the old country. They looked down on people who ate in restaurants. <laughs> Could you imagine the day and age I grew up in? They actually, I, I had amazing relatives. They didn't trust restaurants. They thought it was junk. What do you think that garbage in restaurants <laughs> for? 
<laughs> they assumed all food restaurants was garbage. Only a home cooked meal was good. I, they were probably right, but anyway, in those days they didn't go to restaurants. They didn't trust them. Somehow they felt that only like dumb people who drank a lot ate, ate in restaurants. Usually like uh, wasps who didn't know food to begin with. They were all drunk anyway, so they fed them the worst food in like the Park Hotel on Fifth Avenue. They didn't know what they were eating because they were pickled on gin or whatever. So they looked down at anyone who went to a restaurant. <laughs> the point is, is that whatever she ate, she smelled it first like an animal, but she was right. So I picked that habit up, and people think I'm nuts. So if I go in a restaurant, I say to them, okay, I'll have the fish, bring it out first. They won't do it. They won't bring the fish out. Because you got to smell the fish. Otherwise, how do you know how old it is? What do you think sauces are? Ladies and gentlemen, wake up. You know, today, all the cooking today consists of is taking bad food and doctoring it up with trick dressings in order to cover up the fact that it's not prime food. That's the whole reason. Because really good food doesn't need a sauce on it to begin with. Now, the French need a sauce on everything because their food is terrible. Their food is so bad, everything is inferior. The meats are inferior, the fish is inferior, but they learned through the centuries after Napoleon got his butt kicked how to make sauces to cover up the fact that all of their food was inferior to the Italians. You know, because if you look at it, Italians, they do have sauces, but not like the French with the trick sauces. You know, you know how I always said I like dogs, but I don't like cats. Cats are over, uh, cats are, uh, dogs are overt and cats are covert. I don't like covert anything. I like everything up front. If a dog growls, I know it's growling. Cat's sneaky, but it always, like it makes in a box in a house. You don't know where it is. I don't like that. A dog is up front. You know, they walk, even the way they walk, they're out there. They're out there. It's the same with cuisine. Italian food is like dog-like. It's, 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 it's out there. It's overt. Uh, French food is always covert. It's sneaky. There's always something sneaky about it. We don't know anything about food in this country, of this nature, I mean. All we know is what looks good on a plate. We have geniuses who go to cooking school with pimples on their face, and they come out as long as they know how to drizzle olive oil on something uh, and put strawberries and raspberries on steak. They think that they're a genius. I get the star flounder home after the show. I was in a uh, to cook at home mood. Now, don't get me wrong. I eat in restaurants all the time, but I cook at home once in a while. I was in the mood to cook at home. So I get the star flounder. I open the package, and you put your nose right on the fish. It smelled of the sea. It smelled like fish smelled to me. When I once lived in Marblehead, Massachusetts in the 1970s, I was researching a book, and uh, I was living in Marblehead and commuting to um, to uh, the uh, herbarium up at Harvard, the Harvard Herbarium. I remember a whole winter I spent there. And I used to get fish from the fishing boats down at the, uh, believe it or not, right from the boats. And this is what the fish smell like. It was that good for Monterey. So anyway, here's what you do. It's simple. It reminded me of the years I lived in Spain. How hard is it to cook a piece of fish? Not hard at all. You wash it, you dry it. You don't need salt and pepper on it. I don't know what the obsession is. I watched that chef on the air. As I said, my mother would have thrown him out of her four-burner kitchen. And the chef says, oh, you got to put a little salt and a little pepper on it. He rolled so much salt in it, you needed a hypertension pill. What's this with the obsession? Fish already has salt in the flesh. You get oil very hot. Now, I mean very hot, but I don't mean sizzling, because the fish will burn immediately. you got to get it hot, but not burning. That means hot but not burning. That means hot enough that when you put the flesh in there, it's going to cook immediately, not suck up the oil. And then, and I don't mean an inch thick of oil either, you're not deep frying that fish. But you need it to be deep enough that it covers the fish, but not soaks the fish. So everything has a subtlety to it. So you get the oil hot, you slide the fish fillets in there, you do three minutes on one side, and then you turn it over, you do two minutes on the other, and that's the genius that's the cooking recipe. Now, nobody in the restaurant business will agree with me because you don't make a living just cooking a good piece of fish and oil. You have to trick it with sauces. My dog, Teddy, just came back from the groomer. He looks so sweet. Right now, his coat is still clean. I take him for one walk. He needs another, another bath. I still don't understand a dog like this. I've had every kind of dog in the world. This one, you walk him down the street, he doesn't miss a bush, a pump, a pole, a can. You have to drag him along, and, be, and he rubs against it. That's the part. I don't, I don't mind how he relieves himself. That's his business. He's a dog. I'm not. That's his genetic problem. But that he rubs against it, I don't understand. He ruins the... The, the, the guy almost has to wear a, a raincoat to take him for a walk. I don't walk my dog. I, I hate walking my dog. It's one of my least... Un, I don't like walking a dog.